Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Used to these evening events. Um, welcome to the last, or almost the last, uh, second to the last Liberation and Action 2017 Black History Month series of the Institute for Policy Studies. And we are honored to have with us this afternoon uh, Dr. William Ferguson, also known, well, William Ferguson Reed, also known as Fergie Reed, um, who is the first black member of the Virginia General Assembly. Um, and has a wealth of experience um, in all forms of activism around doing that. Also a medical doctor, I understand. Yes. And so um, he can talk to us about uh, the issues of activism going all the way back uh, around uh, registration, voter registration, all forms, getting legislations passed, all forms of, of activism that goes uh, pretty far back and can be, and actually, because he continues his activism to this day, can actually make a, uh, uh, organic connections to what's happening uh, contemporary, contemporarily, is that a word? Um, and so welcome, thank you very much. Um, what we're gonna do, we have our, um, my colleagues, um, Kenneth Walls and, and Mandisa Ruthini, who are going to sort of do an interview style um, with uh, um, Mr. Reed, Dr. Reed, and then we'll open it up uh, with the more interactive dialogue. So let's welcome Dr. Reed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like he said, um, my name is Kenneth, and um, this is Mandisa, <laughs> um, and um, we just want to get things started. Um, so, with, with decades of service and accomplishments, um, what inspired you to get started on your journey of activism, and what motivates you to continue that work today? Well, uh, thanks for inviting me in. It's a pleasure to be here today. I guess I started to get active uh, with when my parents were involved. They were very active with the NAACP and uh, in civic affairs and trying to make progress and make life better for everybody. And um, I really thought about being involved, but I was in medical school until I finished in 1948, and um, in order to have an internship, there were only about five hospitals in uh, the United States that accepted blacks uh, as interns. Uh, so I felt that something had to be done. I registered to vote when uh, I became 21. Uh, that was in 1946. You had to be 21 years of age at that time. And we had to pay a poll tax of a dollar and a half. And they had to pay that retroactively for three years. Um, and uh, after that time, I went into medical school. Then I went into the uh, Navy. And uh, in the Navy, uh, when the su Supreme Court case down on uh, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, I was the only black person in the unit the medical unit at the time, and I thought that uh, it was great and that it wouldn't be any problem that we're in the United States of America and the Supreme Court talks, everybody listens, and mm -hmm. they go ahead and get over it, you know, and uh, that would be the end of it. But uh, several of the other physicians were white and from the South, and they said, no, it's not going to be that easy, that uh, we're going to have problems, you know. And, so then getting back to uh, Richmond, uh, they had a referendum on uh, whether or not the state should uh, obey the court order or whether or not they should resist it. And the vote was overwhelming in, to resist the, the Supreme Court's order. And at that time, uh, the NAACP had a voter registration committee, which I was on. and. Uh, because the state was trying to put the NAACP out of business by demanding their membership list, uh, the NAACP refused, uh, and they were under a lot of pressure. We decided that if we continue voter registration uh, under the cover of the NAACP, that would be like putting oil on the fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we split and called a group called the Crusade for Voters. And we realized that our only salvation would be to 
increase the voter base so that we could elect people who are sympathetic to our cause. So we set up a plan to do that in Richmond. We weren't trying to save the world. We were only trying to improve conditions in Richmond. Hopefully that it would spread. So we came up with a strategy that in Richmond there are 68 precincts in that city. And we found out that in 28 of them, we had enough, if we could get enough black voters, we could control those 28 and turn, get them to vote that we want, the way we want them to do. That's not an easy job because we were involved in areas with housing projects and people who at the most have finished high school. They were the predominant of black precincts. Uh, the others, we, the people were better educated and better off financially. And we figured that it'd be easier to do it in those precincts. So the three of us who started it, we said, um, okay, why don't we take the precinct that we live in, that should be the easiest one, and take one of the hardest precincts in the housing projects in a, throughout the area. So this is what we did. And the idea was that we would go into each precinct and we would set up a civic organization for that particular precinct so that they would be responsible for any complaints they had against police brutality or not picking up the trash or no lights or whatever, uh, vacant lots like collecting garbage, that they would identify those problems. And then we collectively would go together with them on city council. Uh, but they also their responsibility would be to register new voters. And we said that the only way we can bring back change is by registering new voters. And you've got to register these voters. So voter registration, voter education, and get out the vote were the three principles that we were pursuing. To make a long story short, it caught on. Uh, they set up the civic organizations. We would go in and then give them a boilerplate constitution bylaws help them elect officers for their civic groups and organizations. And uh, uh, they, in turn, would get more and more voters. So as we progressed, and that took several years, and it wasn't overnight. Mm -hmm. So in politics, you have to think in terms of five years or six years. You have to have a five-year plan or a six-year plan or a 10-year plan. You can't have an election and that's it. You know, you got to decide that you're in it, in it for the long run, and you can't be discouraged if you lose elections. But if you lose elections, you still are building the party and building the organization, getting stronger and stronger. A lot of people don't understand that they will tell the candidate, oh, you can't win, you know, or it's going to cost you X number of dollars in order to win, which is not true. Organization. So as a result of that, we were able to influence the elections in the city of Richmond. And we got blacks elected to city council. Uh, eventually, I got elected, and uh, now we have four or five blacks from city council, from city council, and maybe four or five blacks from Richmond in the House of Delegates. So that's how I got involved. Um, I I listened to your uh, part of that story in an interview um, that VCU did mm -hmm. um, that I was watching online about some of your experiences in Korea, mm -hmm. which if some people don't know, Korea is the war that um, the armed forces were officially desegregated. And I thought it was really interesting. Um, I like what you were telling now. And I also liked listening to you said that, you know, people were, like you said, there was pushback, even right. though there was a Supreme Court ruling. Right. And you said that that inspired you to go forward and say, okay, we can have these laws, but we have to have the right elected officials right. and the right judges to follow these laws. So I just wanted to hear more about that, definitely the current climate, and then how that you know related to you working to, to actually campaigning and becoming an elected official yourself. Right. Well, being in this as long as I've been, I know that history does repeat itself. Mm -hmm. And also that, uh, politicians are reincarnated, that uh, <laughs> particularly the bad politicians. <laughs> so uh, with that in mind, 
we're going doing the same thing over now that we did in 1955. Uh, all of these, you know, you think in the real world or the good world that once you resolve the problem, that it was resolved forever, you know. But to be surprised that the things we were fighting that happened in 1902, 1902, they had a constitutional convention in Virginia uh, because immediately after uh, Reconstruction, we had blacks uh, in the Virginia General Assembly, we had black senators, we had black Congress people, and I think we had a temporary black senator, United States senator from Virginia. So because of the progress that was made between 1865 and 1902, uh, Virginia had a constitutional convention and the convener of the convention was Carter Glass. And he was the one that was pushing the poll tax and the Jim Crow laws, you know, about blacks had to sit in the back and couldn't marry whites and all that. So one of his white contemporaries said, Carter, you know, uh, this poll tax, poll tax law is going to keep a whole lot of poor white folks from voting. And he said, you got it right. That's exactly what we want. We don't want any ends. He used the N word, all poor white folks voting. So we think it was all for us, against us, but it was also against whites that they thought may be a threat. And one of the things that I, ways I think that we have missed the boat is that the most invisible group of people in the whole United States are the poor whites. They don't have any advocates. We have the NAACP, we have the Hispanic groups, we have the Muslim groups, we have religious groups, but there's no body who's taken the poor white group to improve them. They don't realize that they're in the same boat with us. They think they are still, they've been brainwashed to think that they're better than poor blacks. So the Republicans are giving them a story that we're looking out for you or not. In Virginia, the people who are killed in the Affordable Rights Act and keeps Virginia from coming of it are the Republicans who lived in the areas that have been decimated by jobs. They're there in uh, Appalachia in uh, Western Virginia, but they still vote Republicans and the Republicans that they are electing are the ones that are killing affordable health care for them. As a result of that, you read that the death rate is increasing in the middle-aged white persons because they don't have health care. Uh, they are now getting hooked on the drugs. When drugs were in the black community, they said, let's increase the jail time. Now that they're in the white community, oh, it's a disease. We have to treat the disease. But well, we told them there was a disease back there in 65 that these people should be treated. But as long as the drug use was in the black community, they said, we got to put them in jail. We got to put them in jail for life on three strikes you out. But now that it's gotten to the suburbs, we got to get more antidotes so we can get these kids and survive them before they even get to the hospital. So you can see how it changes. It depends on where the problem is. So in order to rectify that, we still, any pro uh, political problem that comes up can be solved politically, but we have to have the political tools in order to solve those problems. That's why the key to it is voting. Now, you need a right hand and you need a left hand when you're in a fight. We need people to protest because if you don't have publicity, and the only way we can get publicity is by protesting, and then all of the attention comes to the problem. We did not realize that so many black kids were being killed by the police until somebody publicized it. Now, what do you have to do? You got the publicity, but you got to follow through with action. And if the solution means we got to elect people to city council who can appoint police chiefs or set the tone for the police to work, that's the way you should work, but you don't give up the other, but you work getting the vote out to make things right. The tragedy about Ferguson was that 
It's a majority black uh, city, but they did not have the political people in, in power to take care of it. Yeah. So we lost out because there was nobody there to early enough to motivate them to look, this is a majority city. Your police chief should be a city. You should have members on city council. But nobody brought that attention to them. And I'm sure there are many, many other communities likewise, just like that now, that if something is not done, you're going to have similar situations that you had in Ferguson. Yeah, agreed. Um, staying on that topic as far as um, how, do we, how do we fight back or how do we um, make sure elected officials uphold the law, um, what are some of your suggest suggestions or ideas on how black people and other oppressed communities can mobilize to do such? Okay. First of all, you have to identify the problem. And the problems are going to be different from city to city. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what the problem is, all life is political. You have to have political friends elected that think like you do, or you have to get rid of the people in the elected uh, position, uh, get them out. Mm. And you have, to, for instance, you have to think locally. In other words, you don't try to solve the problems of the world. You try to solve the problems that uh, local problems. So if we can start off by encouraging people to register first, and then to run for public office second. Uh, then you're beginning to make a wedge into the problem. Once you get these people elected that think like you do, then you can bring about change. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, that's why I say you have to think long range, you know, and say, okay, what do we want to do? Uh, when is the next? O oftentimes we think of this election as being the most important, but each election should be a dress rehearsal for the next. So. In the, in, in, we elected Congress in 2018. I'm already thinking 2018, how can we use 2017 to get people elected to Congress in 2018? Well, in Virginia, there are uh, 2,560 precincts. We know now that 100 people are up for Congress, I mean for the House of Delegates. We know that they, uh, they have in Virginia what we call constitutional offices. That would be the sheriff, commonwealth attorney, collect commissioner of revenue, treasurer. We know that they are up in 40 cities right now. So how do we do this? Okay, let's get 100 people running for the House of Delegates. Let's see how many people that we, cities that are electing uh, people to these constitutional offices. Let's make sure that in each city, we have a Democrat running for each one of these constitutional offices. If you get 100 people running for the House of Delegates, then that means you got all 2,560 precincts involved, one way or another. Then when the governor, the lieutenant governor, they are for election, they, you already have the framework for them to run because they are running from those same 2,600 precincts. So if you get people at the lower level running, they will turn out for the people at the higher level. So if you get 100 people running for the House and they all get their friends to come out, they're going to automatically vote for the top of the ticket. When you go up, they say, I'm going to vote for the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general. So you have to start at the base and build that way. Right. So it takes like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you have to put these pieces together so that eventually you're going to get the whole puzzle solved. Gotcha. It might sound a little complicated, but uh, again, it's organization that counts. Um, I definitely wanted to hear more about your 90 for 90 campaign, which you, you know, you've been mentioning, as well as how um, it integrates your political philosophy. You know, you talk about electing the right people. I want to know more about, you know, does that include people of color, indigenous people, black people, is that part of, you know, who are the right people, who represents the people? Does that also include maybe independents, maybe Republicans, maybe other parties, if they, if you feel that they have the same platform? Can I just walk us through that, so the intersections of okay. what you're doing? The way 90 for 90 started is that on my 90th birthday, 
some of the young ladies that I was working with in Chesterfield County, uh, helping them get organized, um, wanted to do something for me, a party or something. So they called my son and uh, he called me and I said, no, I don't want any you know, party, celebration or anything. Hmm. But, but if you put on the program, we're going to 90, or register 90 new voters in each of those 2,560 precincts in Virginia, we were registered over 250,000 new voters by that last election. So that's how I got started. And one of the young ladies is uh, very good with computers. So the next day she had a website up, <laughs> 90 for 90, you know, and so they started it. The idea is that uh, we, we would try to get everybody who's running for public office to make voter registration one of their primary aims. And uh, uh, if they would do that, they could sign on for 90 for 90. And the advantage of signing on for 90 for 90, they could put their web page, their link to their web page, so people could go there and go to their web page and they'll see how to donate money to them and uh, their program, their platform, and so forth. So we started it off in Virginia and it expanded to now that it's uh, throughout the United States. So we talk to the candidates uh, and give them a little information on how to set up, how to set up their precinct teams, how to get involved. Uh, they also can hook into Daily Coast and Daily Coast has a wide network. I wasn't aware of how wide it was and they can raise money through Daily Coast and the money goes, they have it on their uh, website, how they can contribute and so forth. And I was amazed at one lady who got on it from Virginia Beach in a special election, the one that we passed the leaflet out, uh, she uh, got donations from all 50 states. So she's wow. running a special election in Virginia. And uh, uh, just by being on that website, and she was astonished that she got that response. I wasn't aware that, you know, they, that many people, I'm of the old age, you know, and I don't know anything about web, web net and all of that stuff. And uh, so I was really surprised that she did that well. And several others were able to raise money through that. I think politics has gotten to the point that people think about money rather than organize. And they think money can win with money alone. But in some of these areas, uh, say you're running for a, a county board of supervisors. In small counties, there may be just five precincts. And it, you, you can do that without any money. You know, basically, you need a little money for yard size and things like that. So this is where you want to be. You start there, it doesn't cost any money if you organize. So once you get it organized, uh, the better organized it is, the less money you use. Now, the Democratic Party should do that. That should be their responsibility. But they, people in not only the Democratic Party, but the Republican Party, the elected officials are the ones that run it. And they are only interested in raising money so that they can be reelected and their friends can be elected. And they're not really interested in building the party. So that responsibility falls on us. It's our responsibility to build a party and, uh, because we are the party. The people at top, they're not the party, you know. All of the energy comes from us. All of the energy uh, knocking on doors comes from us. All of the support telephone calls come from us. So why deal with the middleman? Why not go directly down to the consumer, the precincts, the people in the precincts? If the party does not, not want to change the way they do, don't fight with any party. You know the solution, you just go ahead and make the solution yourself. And we are the ones who are responsible. And this is why I say that you take a third party, they're never going to be successful because they start at the top of the pyramid running for president. Now, you can't be president if you don't have troops on the ground in the precincts. So it's just a waste of time and effort and money for the third party's solution. Now, the solution is working, doing your own thing if you want to be with the party, fine. The party does help. In other words, that uh, you have a team, hopefully. It's not perfect yet, but it's up to us to make it perfect if we are in the party. 
we can't blame all oh, the party doesn't do this party doesn't do that but we are the party we are the people we are the energy we supply the energy that runs the party if you look at a pyramid say in egypt uh you look at the base there are these gigantic stone ones there uh, nobody knows how they got there where they came from they then as you go up each course, the stones get smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to the top. Everybody looks at the top. Oh, and that's, a, that's great. Then if you go to a football game, you see the cheerleaders perform a pyramid. Have five big guys at the bottom, three little guys, two at the top, they have one person. Everybody looks at the top. Nobody sees those big guys down there struggling. They're trying to hold them up. They, but in the pyramids, it's the same thing. The energy comes from the bottom. You have all of these stones at the top with the force of gravity pushing down on these stones at the bottom, and they're pushing to keep it up and holding it up. You can't see the energy there, but the energy is there. And it's the same way with political pyramids. Everybody looks at the top, governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general. Then you look at Virginia, the 11 congressmen. Then you look at the 40 senators. Then you look at 100 people in the house. Then you look at the uh, maybe a thousand people running for city council, county board of supervisors, and nobody looks at the precincts at the bottom of that pyramid. All of the energy comes from the bottom of the pyramid, the base of the pyramid. You and you and you and you, you are the ones that are voting. You're the ones that are getting out here knocking on doors. You supply the energy. You supply the money. So the top base, and it's up to us to start at the base and make our part of the base stronger. If we do that and on the precinct level, then each one does it. You've got a tremendous force at the base of the pyramid that can put anybody at the top that they want. Nice. Nice. Um, going back to um, how you discuss uh, daily, um, what's the name of that site? Daily Coast. Daily Coast. Yeah, Daily Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have a lot of articles. Yeah, you talked. About, yeah, you talked about how um, the difference with how you didn't know about um, their network and things of that nature. What are some of the, the um, differences from um, activism work now, um, other than some of the activism work in the past? What are some of the key differences? Some of the things you're intrigued by um, that we we we're struggling with, or we have. Um, easier those types of things right uh, when we uh came along the computers were just had these big ibm watching mm -hmm. so by we use that technique but and then, then we had a voter registration list we could get so when i was running i had people to write on four by five cards the name and address and telephone number of all the people that we could identify by precinct so on election day uh and we had poll workers at the election you know workers and they would scratch off the names of the people to pull out the cars that they voted and put it on one side. And then put out the cars that hadn't voted. And by three o'clock, we would check those who had not voted. And we had drivers to go and pick those people up. But now all of that stuff is in a computer, you know. So you can get all of that information already available. All of the voter registration lists are available. All of the, uh, you can get them on the computer, you can put it in your computer. They have what they call the band list. There's a list of all the people who have voted, strong Democrats, weak Democrats, unknown, 
weak Republicans, strong Republicans. Not only with the name, address, telephone, age, but they also have them by precincts. So you can pull that list up by precincts and just concentrate on the precinct that you live in uh, and get that information available. Uh, we had telephones, we didn't have computers, we didn't have mobile telephones, so everything had to be done by the digital telephones. Um, so we did have not have the networks, social networks that you have because we didn't have a computer. So all of that is new to me, you know. Uh, so what I tell people who run it for political office, I tell them that first of all, the fact that you're interested in running tells me that you're addicted to politics and you're gonna be in it for the rest of your life. And you might, as, I started in 19, I got hooked in 1946. So and I'm still hooked. <laughs> and uh, I said, you might as well do it right. So what you need is a spreadsheet of all your contacts. And in that information, I know you got the email address. That's usually what you all have in communication. And you know how to text them. But you don't know where they live, you know, and you have no idea where they live. You're not even interested in where they live. Uh, because you can get in touch with them without even worrying about that. But in politics, it's a different thing. Uh, you are the general when you're running for public office, but a good general needs to know the terrain that you're fighting in and also where your troops are. So I tell them the first thing they got to do, they got to set up a spreadsheet with all of that information on there. In addition to the information you usually get, you got to have congressional district, state senate district, state house district, county, county district, precinct name and number. That's very important because if you get that information on your own computer, if you need to talk to somebody in Precinct 101, you go to your computer and find out how many contacts you have that live in Precinct 101, and you get on the phone or you text them or whatever you do. You say, look, I want you to set up a team for me in your precinct. And we got four or five names. These people also live in there. They say, oh, I know him, I know him. So what do you want me to do? All we want you to do is be responsible for registered new voters in that. We have a list of everybody who's active politically, uh, who lives in that. So all we want you to do, they come up about 10 to a page, call, we're gonna give you a page of people to call and ask them to join the team. We know they're strong Democrats, so uh, the most we want them to do is contact 10 people and get them to join the team and give them a list. And, keep spreading it that way so that we saturate that precinct with known Democrats and they are autonomous and you say, what do you mean autonomous? We want you to register all of the teenagers that are turning 18 each day. We want you to uh, make sure that people are registered and that there are significant others are registered because we got to increase the vote within this precinct. Now how much do we have to increase it? Well, you go to past elections and you see precinct 101 that the Republican won by 200 votes, the Democrat had 150. You know you got to find 100 more votes between now and election day so you can beat those Republicans. So all the information is right there, which we didn't have. So you know you can set a goal for each precinct. Okay, uh, the Republicans won that by 50 votes we got to exceed what they voted for. This is our goal. So when you get to October, you know how many people you contacted in that precinct, you know where the Democrats are, and you know whether you're gonna win that precinct there. And you don't need a poll or anything like that because you got your internal poll. You know what your goals are and you still got time to meet that goal. So you do that for each of the precincts and just this is all we want you to do, you know. We don't want you to come over here to make calls. We don't want you to go over there and knock on doors. When I come in, we're going to knock on doors right within your neighborhood where you are. So in theory, <laughs> that's the way it would work, but it's very difficult to do that. And it's a responsibility for the Democratic Party to already, to already set that up so that would be in place, but they don't do that. They're not interested in doing it. If they don't do it, we have to do it, you know, so. This is where we're trying to encourage that, to let people know that you can't put the blame on somebody else for something not being done. 
it's our responsibility to do that. And uh, that's the only way we're going to get ahead by doing it ourselves. Good part about it, it doesn't cost any money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you opened up with talking about in politics, you know, things aren't resolved, things come back. Right. And as you know, the Voting Rights Act is, you know, being gutted. Right. And we have continued voter disenfranchisement. We saw a lot of that this last election. So what do you think should be the focus of African Americans when it comes to voting rights? And, you know, how do we play the game and keep moving forward? Well, again, the vote is the answer. Uh, we can get out here and complain, blame other people uh, about our, what's happening to us. But the only way we can is by electing people who want to be right. Uh, that, I see it as a solution. The other, that's the key, but again, you got to have protests and to bring about the publicity that we would not ordinarily get. But the key to it is voting. And it's up to us to vote uh, encourage people to run or run ourselves for these basic positions that oftentimes the National Party and State Party, oh, we're not going to get involved in those uh, bottom of the ticket uh, races. But that's where the action is, and that's how you build your party. So you got to get involved at the local level uh, by making sure that all of the people that uh, doing other things, also realize that uh, publicity is good, but that doesn't resolve the problem. That the only way you can resolve the problem is putting people in there who can eliminate the bad laws and make good laws. So the key is political activity on the local level. Um, so there's a poster um, that that stated um, sure you've seen this many times. <laughs> yeah, a solid a solid Negro to give us representation. Um, and so we wanted to know, do and I guess this poster was in nineteen sixty five. Right. Um, do we still need to work do we still need to work on solidarity um, and elect leadership um, that looks like us? No well no not necessarily. Uh, our politics is local. And I think you have to decide locally what's best for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, there's not a one size fits all politics. So you have to, the basics are the same. You want to elect somebody regardless of the color that's going to represent you. And this is where you can swing the difference. You may be in a majority white neighborhood like we were in Richmond, but you have to, have to support people who think like you. Mm. And they don't it have to be purist. Uh, you know, they don't have to check off every item that you think that you want a politician to be. You're going to have to make say, well, he may be a little weak on this, but but he's strong on this. A little leeway, you know, because they are uh, in a diverse group. So you're not going to get perfection in any politician. Yeah. The only way you can get the politician that agrees with you 100% of the time is to run yourself. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so you're not going to get the perfect uh, politician. So you may have to make a compromise, but if you make that compromise and vote for that individual, we have found out that they are more likely to listen to you if they know that you voted for them in the past. We've done that. We voted for, uh, as I was explaining before, we would have a slate of nine candidates if they elected large. This is when they elected at large. Now, uh, our House of Delegates, after the Voting Rights Act, you have to uh, elect by district. Mm -hmm. But in that, at large election, we, uh, in the city council, there are nine city council persons. So we knew from past performance the ones that were going to lead the ticket, whether or not they got our vote or not. So we would put them on our slate. If there might be four of them, we picked the three best that we know they're going to win. And then we've been knowing that people who are running, there are three people are not going to win, even with our support. So we would get a slate with the nine, three that we know we're going to win, three that we know we're going to lose, 
and put the three that we wanted to win uh, in the middle uh, on our sleeve. We would put all nine of them on our sleeve, pass our sample ballots with all nine of them. And as the election turned out, we would always elect five of the nine. So mm -hmm. they would say the crusade elected a majority. <laughs> so they would give us more power than we knew we had, you know, because nine, five of the people were on our sleeve. So it wasn't anything uh, marvelous about it. It wasn't because we had the political power, but they thought that we had the political power. And uh, on the other states, we may get two or three or four, but our state would always get the, the majority. So uh, as I say, each, pilot, each race is different, but you have to use a different technique of, uh, you know, achieving what your goals are. Ooh, thank you. I was wondering more about how being a doctor and being in the healthcare profession has affected your politics and your thinking of politics and connecting healthcare with voter rights, desegregation, those types of things, equality. Well, it wasn't my intention to run for public office at the time. Uh, as I explained before, uh, we were trying to make inroads into the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party was almost what you call a private country club party. It made it very difficult for blacks to get elected. Uh, because of that, we were able to make inroads with liberal white Democrats or moderate white Democrats who thought the Democratic Party should be open. So when the House of Delegates came up, there were nine people to run for that e election. And we insisted that the Democrats include a black among those nine that were running from uh, Richmond and Henrico together. Henrico is the county that surrounds Richmond, it's over the size of a congressional district, but uh, that's how big a district it was. So we convinced them that they had to put black on the slate. I was not the black that we wanted. We wanted another black that was prominent and active in the NAACP and all. Uh, crusade for voters and so forth. So at the last minute, he decided that he would not run. Mm. So then they said, well, Fergie, you got to run, you know. <laughs> so I got caught in the mojo, as they say. And, uh, I, that's how it fell about me. I did not have any intentions. So once I got in, I felt I had an obligation to stay, you know, as long as I could. You know? But you had to, we were only in session 60 days out of the year. And so I could, practice some of the time and do that. But it was a sacrifice to the family. And, uh, there were some, you know, uh, downsides of it. No. Have you integrated um, that experience into your work? Have you ever championed health care? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Uh, one of the things that, uh, when I went to Richmond uh, as a surgeon, uh, I could not join the medical society because the Richmond Academy of Medicine had in its constitution that it was only open to white physicians. So in order to get on the staff of any of the hospitals, you have to be a member of the Academy of Medicine. You have to be a member of the uh, Virginia branch of the AMA and be a member of the AMA. Because we could not join the academy, we could not join the state medical society, we could not join the AMA. So, uh, you caught in the box, you know. So, we did have a black hospital where, you know, I practiced. Uh, it did not have all of the facilities that the other hospitals had. In uh, Richmond, we had a city hospital, when city hospitals were the main hospitals, but that was under the guise of Medical College of Virginia. So that was out. But fortunately, uh, as the civil rights movement came along, they had what they call the Hill Burton's Plan project. The federal government gave money to community hospitals, but one of the contingencies was that you had to have an open staff. And that meant that anybody who was qualified to practice medicine 
could become a member of the Shea of that hospital. And then we built one in Richmond, a uh, Richmond Memorial Hospital, and so we were able to integrate that hospital. We also had to fight the Medical Society, of, uh, Richmond Academy of Medicine, to get them to finally accept blacks. So that was another fight that we had to have. Uh, the old god uh, ran the Richmond Academy of Medicine. So that was a big fight to get them to accept blacks. So it was, you're fighting not on just one battle, you're fighting on several different fronts. So uh, we were involved in all of those. You want to close it out? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we could close it out. One of the last questions that we'll ask you, and then we'll open it up to the public. Um, in 1956, you have launched the Richmond Crusade for Voters, uh, hoping to mobilize Black voters. Um, what advice would you give to young activists and organizers, organizers looking to get more involved in the current movement? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you got to identify a problem that you're concerned about. And then you have to identify people who think like you. And then you, whatever the problem is, you've got to find out what is the solution and how do we reach that solution. So this is our problem. We, our problem is that we had all of these uh, obstructions to voting, to getting the practice going, you know, breaking down that barrier. Several barriers had to break down. One thing I would advise anybody is to concentrate on one particular problem. Don't try to solve all the problems in the world. Mm -hmm. That if there are five problems out there, you pick the one that you think is most important to you, and you try to get other people to take a lead in these other problems. But you collaborate with them, with your, your team. But once you take on, for instance, you can get 100 people to agree that we need to register more voters, but, and you can concentrate on that. But if you can, if you say, well, we got to do something about charter schools, you immediately separate your group into two. And you're bringing in something that really might be important, but you can't solve two problems. So I would concentrate on one particular problem. And if there are other problems, for, for instance, we got, when we were boycotting Stonehammers to get them to integrate, uh, they said, why didn't the crusade take on uh, the boycott? You know, setting up the, we said, no, we got good people within the crusade, crusade who can do it. But everybody's gonna work together, but we can't take the leadership. Let somebody else take the leadership on it and we will work with them. And we will encourage our members to work with them because it's like a wheel with in the real, you know, in the black community, all of us have problems, and we, some people, sometimes we take on too much that we can do, but, and people may not be interested in voter registration, but they're interested in something else, you know, they, so that would be my advice. All right, well, I thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, now we open it up to the, to the floor. Uh, if anybody have any questions, uh, ask away. curious how you see a lot of movements about the intersections of movements. You just spoke about the need to focus on one issue, which makes a lot of sense. You pick the issue you are passionate about and focus on that, and other people will work on other important issues. But at the same time, we've paid a price for having movements that are very specific and relatively narrow and haven't had real ways in a consistent basis of working together. How do you see that challenge? It is a challenge. Um, you were asking about health care. I believe in universal health care. You know, member of several organizations that uh, have that same goal. And I see that a lot of organizations really don't want anything done. They're out there, they raise money, and they don't want to resolve the problem because if they resolve the problem, they're out of business. So you have that, that dilemma. 
they want the publicity of doing something, but when you come up with a solution, they don't accept it. For instance, there are thousands, or maybe not thousands, but at least a hundred organizations want universal health care. And it's as close as they can get together is that they have an advisory board of several people from the different organizations, but they don't come up with a plan. And Phyllis, you heard me say this. I said, okay, in all of these organizations that are pushing universal health care, I would imagine there are probably 23 million or maybe 25 million people, members. Labor has, what, 12 million members? Uh, some of the other groups have 200,000, some of them have 300,000. We have physician organizations, we have nurses organizations, all of them have members. Why can't we get together, all of you identify your members by not only name, address, telephone number, email address, zip code, county, county congressional district, state senate district, state house district, precinct name and number. If all of you all did that, we could say which congressman is against universal health care. Go to your computer and pull up the names. You know, we don't need the names. We say, I got uh, 25 people in Congressman So's district. Another group may have 10 people in that district. Okay, well, let's get an email to all those people and tell them they're going to have to get somebody to run against Congressman So to do that and get that on a local level and give them support to get rid of that particular congressman. But that's work. <laughs> Doesn't cost any money. They all have computers. They all have interns that can do the work to look up the information on their members. They send out an email. They all have the email address. Send out an email, say, please send us this information. Look on your voter registration card. We want to be more effective in lobbying uh, for our particular cause. So you find maybe a thousand people in each congressional district. A thousand people, if you know them, they can move the world, you know. They can do wonders. But you can't even get them to think about that because I'm never in the inside part of it, but I express my opinion, you know, as to what should be done. And, uh, but it requires some organization and work and nobody wants to do it. Doesn't cost them any money, but it takes a little time to do that. Uh, again, you got your interns, you got staff, you got computers. Uh, they get emails out every day asking for money, you know. Uh, we have, and I don't know what they do. I call them and I said, you can't get to them because they don't have a telephone number. And I don't know why they don't put a telephone number on their website. Uh, contact us and you got to put information in there. And uh, even if you do that, they don't answer. So it's kind of hard to get to the person that makes the decision. And even to talk to them and suggest it, but some of them I have talked to them and I, they said, well, that's a good idea. I have to talk to my computer people and they never call you back and let you know what happens. But this is what I think we have to do. We have to coordinate the efforts of all of these single cause organizations. To solve the health problem, we have every disease has an organization that's pushing that disease. And if we just got them coordinated to unify their membership list, we could do it with just them, you know. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's an idea, but uh, if you don't have the tools to implement that idea, it's never get done. Uh -huh. uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. I uh, grew up in, in Virginia, northern Virginia, um, since uh, my early 70s. And, and to see the kinds of changes there just blows me away. Um, my family moved to Sterling, Virginia in 1970. And I didn't know until just a few years ago on Wikipedia that it was established in 1962 with the Whites Only Covenant. Um, and all of my elementary schools in that town at the time were named after local slave plantations, right. unironically. Right. And, and in high school, we moved to Reston, Virginia, completely, you know, across the county line, a totally different politics, or substantially different. But now, uh, the changes that have happened in the past 30 years, or 40 years, are just astounding in terms of the 
diversity. Uh, Loudoun County used to be this kind of Confederate sleepy, you know, yeah. backwater. It was kind of scary if you didn't kind of never went west of, uh, of Loudoun County. Uh, but now it's incredibly diverse. Um, and Stony Virginia is now, I think, majority minority. Um, and I'm, the easiest thing to point to would be the tech sector, I guess, uh, when, when AOL moved out to Dulles Airport right. and began this kind of the diversification of the economy. But I'm wondering what other social drivers, other industries or, or The rest of the world, you know, the low economic whites were not exposed to blacks until they got into the union. You know, they may not have liked it immediately, but uh, again, I think we still have to do everything we can do to revive the unions because uh, they are progressive and uh, uh, they have helped quite a bit, even though originally some of these unions were segregated and uh, because father and son both of them were electricians and they didn't want anybody else breaking up that caste system, you know, uh, family electricians, family plumbers, or family uh, whatever. Uh, they kind of kept, kept it in the family until uh, eventually that was broken down. So uh, they were not perfect, but they had to comply with the union rules that they belonged to. So eventually that was broken down. So I think jobs would help tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank you for uh, this presentation. I've tracked your career for a long period of time with uh, great interest and admiration. And this presentation underscores how astute and reflective a thinker you are. Uh, if you think back in time, the one thing that um, probably bears repeating um, in any setting um, as a trade-off. We've got more tools, but a different set of motivators right. in terms of getting with people. Um, it, it can't be stated enough how much physical courage it took uh, through time and continuously. Right. Um, <laughs> there, there, there are accounts. I grew up in uh, a part of North Carolina. Curiously, we is one of our family names. You can find the part of Wayne County in North Carolina, I grew up in by uh, just entering a search into Reed Town <laughs> because that's where the people own the uh, property, uh, Wayne County, Wilson County. And there's a there's an account by a reporter at the time of um, about policeman in Wilson, where curiously the congressman now is the son of my first dentist, Butterfield. He Butterfield is my age, 70 now. But mm -hmm. um, uh, there's an account of how this one policeman would go after people who would do unwarranted searches for NAACP cards. Right. And in one, one account, the, uh, the the guy asked, "Where's your what's your search warrant?" And he did it upside the head right. of the man and said, "That's half of my search warrant." And put his hand on his gun and said, "You want to see the other half of my search yeah. warrant?" Um, I, I offer that anecdote for this frames the kind of thing. And the other piece of that is a, a brief story about how thoroughgoing the change in culture in Richmond um, got to be. And this is a, a you know kind of very personal thing. One of the longest times I've spent in Richmond, because it used to just be the place that because there were no highways, <laughs> you had to take two hours going through there is right. to get north of there. Um, was I went to the funeral, Pentecostal Holiness funeral there in in Richmond. It was the mother of my best friend. 
And there was a white guy who got me through the thing, who was very conversant with all of this, uh, who I was very impressed with the seriousness and his sense of the world and commitment to social justice was Senator Keynes. Right. And I said, there's something special going on here that's broader than just these kinds of things. Because, you know, I've experienced um, a, the kind of change where it's, you know, there's a shortfall and a deficit often in the political change. I went through this with uh, Durham. I was actually born in Duke University Hospital. And, but, but before, when I was 16 years old, I still couldn't have gone to Duke University right. just to place it in, in time. Uh, but my best friend as a child was uh, the namesake grandson of Charles Spaulding, who won't right. go back to Durham because of the political sellout mm. of the black community by this very substantial business sector in a very self-serving way. So I was very impressed by the thoroughgoingness of what happened with the cultural and political change um, in Richmond that you had a major hand in. But I, I did want to underscore for people, they need to hear the amount of physical courage you took. I mean, it's, what's most rare is this level of acumen. <laughs> um, but there are not, not enough people who just have the physical courage to say, this is what it takes and right. nobody else is going to do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Thank, so, you. thank you. Again. Thank you. So? Could I just ask one? Sure. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you, can, you can ask as many as you want. <laughs> <laughs> A follow up on this question about courage. Um, it seems right now we're in a moment when it's going to take enormous courage from people like judges and maybe at some point, maybe members of Congress who haven't shown much of it. And they haven't had to, in, you know, right. in fairness. They're, they're, they, the demand hasn't been there. They haven't needed to be courageous. Maybe a judge here or there you know, had to fight against some local power figure or a local landlord or whatever. But in the main, you didn't have to be brave to be a, even a decent judge. And now you kind of do. And maybe you could just talk a little bit about that question of how movements create courageous activists and courageous leaders as much as courageous leaders and activists create movements. I mean, how does, how does that come together? Well, first of all, you have to know that, unfortunately, money is a big part of politics. And um, a lot of the judges are elected. Uh, some of them appointed. In Virginia, they're appointed by the General Assembly. Uh, but in some states, they are elected by the people. And the corporations pay a big part in who gets to be elected a judge and also uh, to, to your various other areas. So you're going to have to get rid of these bad people. And the only way you can get rid of them is to buy them or to vote them out of office. And it takes a lot of courage for some people to run for public office because their livelihood may be dependent on the people who are paying the judges or paying the people who are in the elected office. So it is very difficult to do that, bring about change. And you can't do it over a short period of time. You got to be in it for the long run. And the only thing you would have to do is sit down again and say, what is the problem? You know, what is keeping us back? And then what can we do to correct that problem? And that that is the, the hard part of it. Again, I say, you got to register more people to vote so you can get good people to run. And good people are not going to run uh, if it's going to be Jeopardy to their job, you know. Um, so the, it is a dilemma. And, and, and again, each situation is separate. There's no one solution to any one of it. So, first of all, you got to isolate the problem 
and find out who it affects and what can we do to get these people that it affects mostly to start getting involved in getting the bad guys. I, uh, that's not a direct answer, but uh, I think that's basically the best I can give. Thank you. Well, uh, and so concludes our interview of Dr. William Ferguson Reed, Fergie. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you. You definitely um, highlighted that he's been a vanguard in the re emerging black political power in Virginia. Um, people have said that they should name schools after him. That he not only does he have decades and decades of activism under his belt, he still continues to this day. So no matter where you're at on the political spectrum or where you are, um, we have to take this moment to honor a living legend. Thank and you. To a lot of wisdom. Yeah. Um, what away from today is that I need to make sure that I'm a vanguard and right. I'm passionate about Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.